reaction mechanisms, and curved arrow pushing. It's going to be the topic in this last lesson on a chapter of organic reactions and mechanisms. Now, we're going to go through and identify the four most common mechanistic steps and the associated curved arrow pushing. We'll actually work through several examples, show the arrow pushing, which shows the movement of electrons involved in each, uh, because these are things you're definitely going to need to get down and understand fairly well before we start using them uh, in the mechanisms of well over 100 reactions by the time you finish second semester. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to make science both understandable and maybe even enjoyable. Now, this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so mechanisms. So mechanisms are just a big sequence of steps where we show all the bonds being broken and all the bonds being formed uh, on the way and in the order in which they happen and converting reactants into products. Now, it turns out there's four very common mechanistic steps. Now, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's the four most common that'll come up time and again. And then we'll do one that's kind of going to be standalone from those four, the one of the less common types. So, but those four types are going to be nucleophilic attack. They're going to be loss of a leaving group, uh, proton transfer, which is just simply a bronzed acid-based reaction. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a rearrangement. And specifically, we'll do a carbocation rearrangement, which will be the most common type of rearrangement you'll see. See, but later in second semester, you might see a couple of other funky rearrangements. But suffice to say, in first semester here, the only type of rearrangement you're likely to see is a carbocation rearrangement. All right, so let's take a look at the first couple here. And in this case, I'm going to give you reactants and products, and then we're going to have to fill in the curved arrow pushing that shows us how to get from reactants to products. And uh, the idea here is that. Uh, again, these curved arrows are going to show us the movement of electrons. And first principle is that when you've got a double-headed arrow, and when I mean when I say double-headed arrow, I mean where it's got the two heads to it, that shows the movement of two electrons. Whereas if I've got a half-headed arrow, that shows the movement of one electron at a time. Uh, and that'll be important. So most of the time, we're going to be dealing with two-headed arrows and showing the movement of two electrons at a time. But when we deal with ra uh, in reactions involving radicals, as we'll see, we'll be using these much more commonly. So, And radicals aren't going to be super common. We'll have one big chapter where we deal with radicals. But most of the rest of uh, organic chemistry, uh, we'll see very few reactions actually involving radicals and why we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. So the last reaction in the chapter will deal with these. But up until that point, the most common, four most common, again, types of steps are all going to involve moving pairs of electrons at a time. So if we look at this first one here, so we look at reactants and products and you say, okay, what's different? And it really helps if you draw in all the lone pairs, especially early on when you're starting to get these mechanistic steps down and stuff. And uh, in this case, you see that bromine's got four lone pairs and in the end, he's only got three. One of those lone pairs must have done something. I also see that I've got a new bond between carbon and bromine that didn't exist on the reactant side. And so now I can see, oh, so one of these lone pairs on bromine must have been used to make that new bond. And so the arrow we draw is from one of the lone pairs to the atom it ends up bonded to. And so notice I didn't draw the arrow to the positive sign. I drew it to the carbon. Or at least I got as close to it as I could get without positive sign being in the way, but to the carbon itself. And in this case, we call this nucleophilic attack. So and just like I pointed out in the last lesson, I like to think of nucleophilic attack as nucleophilic attach. So we say the nucleophile attacks the electrophile. In this case, the electron-rich species donating the electrons to make the bond would be called the nucleophile. And the species being bonded to would be called the electrophile. And this is one of the more common mechanistic steps we'll see throughout organic chemistry here. Uh, in this case, that's the only arrow, just one arrow showing that these two electrons have been used to make a bond to this carbon and voila, there, those two electrons have now become those two electrons in the bond. That's nucleophilic attack. All right. So if we look at the next step here, this is actually the exact reverse of the first reaction. So instead of making the bond between bromine and carbon here, now we're going to have that bond between bromine and carbon. We have it to begin with, but it breaks in the process. And so in this case, I can see that those two electrons in that bond aren't present in the product. So those have to go somewhere. Where do they go? Well, I can see that I've got three lone pairs on bromine. So, and we're going to end up with four. And so in this case, we're going to take and draw an arrow 
from the electrons in the bond, again, the arrows always show where electrons go, not where atoms go. We'll take those two electrons and we'll make them go to the bromine as they'll be a lone pair on that bromine atom. And in this case, if all we're doing is breaking a bond, so as we're doing here, we refer to that as loss of a leaving group usually results in two separate species, but that's not always the case, but it is the most likely scenario. So loss of a leaving group. And so now we've covered two of the more common mechanistic steps, nucleophilic attack, loss of a leaving group. So we'll see a couple more examples uh, we'll do. We'll see another nucleophilic attack, but we'll also see Bronsted acid base reaction, AE proton transfer. And we'll also see a rearrangement here in a little bit. All right, and the next couple here. So here we've got what's called an alkene, one of those functional groups you'd learn back in the day. And uh, this is a very common mechanistic step. And a lot of those alkene reactions, we're gonna study a couple chapters from now. Uh, but this is a little bit tricky and it might be easier. You know, I said earlier, if you draw all the lone pairs, it makes it easier. So, and for some of these early on, now we won't typically do this when we get there, but for some of these early on, it might even help if you draw in some hydrogen. So I'm gonna redraw this one time here so we can kind of see what's going on. And, show the relevant hydrogens that might help make this just a little easier to decipher. Okay, so now that we can see the hydrogens, we can kind of get a better idea of what's going on. And so which electrons are moving and stuff like this. And I can see that uh, this bond right here must be breaking. So I'm gonna kinda just put a little asterisk there to remind me of what's going on because I can see that bromine's no longer bonded to H in the end, so that bond must break. Okay, so what else is going on? Well, we've got the pi bond that's no longer present in the product. So that pi bond has gotta go do something as well. So, and then from there, I can kind of see that this carbon right here, which has two hydrons, is gonna end up with three, whereas this carbon right here, which has one hydrogen, still is only gonna have one hydrogen. So I can see where I'm making a new bond, and that third hydrogen right here, well, must be this guy, the only other place he can get a hydrogen from. And so I need to make a new bond between this carbon and this hydrogen to get here. That pi bond needs to go away and this bond needs to break, and bromine needs to end up with one more lone pair to get to four lone pairs. All of those need to happen in this mechanistic step. And so in this case, I can see that if bromine needs a lone pair, well, he's gonna get it from that bond breaking. Okay, and those two electrons are gonna end up going to bromine and being his fourth lone pair. Now, the rest of this is a little bit tricky, but we know this pi bond needs to move, and the question, where's it go? Well, it turns out it is being used to create so the new bond to this hydrogen. So cool, so we're gonna bond to this hydrogen. In this case, drawing it from the, uh, the bond itself, that actually could mean one of two things. It's a little ambiguous what it means when we draw it like this. It could mean that we're either bonding to this hydrogen with this carbon or this carbon. We would draw the same arrow either way. And so in this case, for us, we know it means bonding to this carbon because that's, you know, been the products were supplied to us. We know it's going there, but we would have drawn the same arrow had it ended up on this carbon as well. It wouldn't have actually looked any different. So with a pi bond, a little bit tricky there, but in this case, it is being used to make a new bond between in this case, I'll just draw in a little dashed line to kind of show us where that's happening, but that's not actually part of the mechanism. So, but it's being used to make a new bond right here between carbon and hydrogen. But that's why this carbon is now gonna be missing a bond and have a positive formal charge because the pi bond's gone. It was used to make a bond to a third hydrogen right there. So, but this is it for the arrows. It's actually just these two arrows. We're gonna move the, use the pi electrons to make a new bond between carbon and hydrogen. And then the bond between hydrogen and bromine is going to break. And so what we call this is a little bit tricky. So in this case, we could call this nucleophilic attack with the alkene being the nucleophile and HBr being the electrophile. So however, some people might say, well, if, if the atom you're attaching to is a hydrogen, you might actually just call this a bronsted lowry acid base reaction. But you'll see that when we introduce this in the alkene chapter, we probably will still refer to this as nucleophilic attack. And that's kind of how I've highlighted on your sheet. But technically, some people might be like, oh, Chad, this might actually be bronsted acid base reaction, a proton transfer. And, and technically, there's a little bit of, of confusion, and I shouldn't even say confusion, a little bit of vagueness here on which one it is. Or, and, and technically, you'll see it referred to as both 
both in literature. So if we go back to the original where we didn't draw in all the hydrogens then, so just so we can see this one more time, we're going to make a bond between this carbon and the hydrogen, and then hydrogen can only have one bond, so the old one has to break. And that was the arrow pushing. So going back to here, and again, you'll get more and more comfortable with this as we go and as we start actually doing these mechanisms in the, in the coming chapters without having to draw all the hydrons in. But if it helps early on, definitely draw them in, help yourself out a little bit here. Now this next one here, if we take a look, so I can see that this bond between oxygen and hydrogen no longer exists. And oxygen, instead of having two lone pairs, is going to end up with three lone pairs. I can also see that there's a new bond between this oxygen and hydrogen as well. So in this case, the oxygen goes from having three lone pairs to having just two lone pairs. And so in this case, the hydrogen is transferring from this oxygen over to this oxygen. And this is much easier to recognize as what we call a proton transfer reaction, or simply just a bronsted acid base reaction. Back in, in chapter three, we just simply called it an acid base reaction. And so most of the time in organic chemistry, when we just say acid base reaction, usually what we really mean is a bronsted acid base reaction. So because a nucleophile electrophile reaction is a Lewis acid base reaction. So but if I just say acid base, most of the time it means specifically that it's a bronsted acid base reaction. All right, so looking at this here then, I can see that I need to make a new bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen, and that the oxygen, which has three lone pairs, only ends up with two, so he's going to use one of his lone pairs to pull this off. And so we're going to make a new bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen. Hydrogen can only make one bond. So if we're going to make a new bond to hydrogen, then the old one right here must break. Well, where do those two electrons go? Well, this oxygen right here has two lone pairs. He's going to end up with three lone pairs. And so that's where they go. So forming that third lone pair, that bond breaks to form those. And that's the arrow pushing or the motion of electrons going here. Now, a lot of students will screw something like an acid base reaction here up because they'll actually want to start an arrow from the hydrogen. They're like, yep, he's going over to the oxygen. But again, keep in mind, the arrows don't show you where atoms go. They show you where the electrons are going. And here, an arrow should never start from an atom that doesn't have a lone pair of electrons. So, because technically every time an arrow starts, it actually doesn't actually start from the atom. It starts from the lone pair of electrons on that atom. Every arrow should have its origin at electrons every time. So this would definitely not be the arrow you want in blue here. So just want to point out common rookie mistake there. So, but this is your proton transfer or bronsted lowry acid base reaction. All right, so we're gonna look at this next example. And in this case, we've got a carbocation. And the carbocation is actually gonna change locations. It's somehow gonna end up, you know, start from this location and end up in this location. So, and again, a carbocation just means that you are missing electrons here. In carbon's case, it means there's no filled octet. He's only got three bonds and not four. So that's the way carbon ends up with a positive formal charge. And the question is how? And on your study guide, I was nicer than I am right here. I actually drew in all the relevant hydrons and stuff like that. And I'm going to go back and do that again. So this is a methyl group. This is a methyl group. This is a methyl group. And we have a hydrogen attached here. And we have one hydrogen attached here. And then once again, this is a methyl group. This is a methyl group. This is a methyl group. And now we have two hydrogens attached to that carbon and none attached to this carbon. Again, only three bonds. So again, the carbon with a positive formal charge only has one, two, three bonds. Carbon with a positive formal charge only has one, two, three bonds. And that's how we can kind of infer how many hydrogens are there. This carbon no longer had a positive formal charge, so it must have four bonds. That's why we had room to draw in two hydrogens, not just one. And now we get a little clearer picture on what's going on here. So you, if you follow the positive charge, you're going to miss it. That positive charge, lo and behold, doesn't even exist. If you look at this molecule under an electron microscope, you wouldn't see a plus sign. Go figure. So don't look, don't be fooled by that plus sign. Again, the, the arrows always show the movement of electrons. The plus sign is just a label to show us that this guy's electron deficient. So it has a formal charge. So don't, don't be fooled by that. We want to really follow those electrons. And, and in this case, we want to follow the atoms as well and see where the new bonds are created. And we see that this hydrogen right here must be ending up as one of these two hydrogens right here, because he's no longer going to end up attached to this carbon, but this carbon's only bonded to one hydrogen and ends up being bonded to two. And so somehow that has to move over. Well, in this case, don't follow the atom though. Again, follow the electrons. So this bond right here needs to break. Okay. So not there. 
in the product. And it needs to reattach to this carbon right here. And so this is not the most intuitive thing in the world, but this bond breaking and then reattaching. So it's just kind of like the hydrogen and its electrons pluck off and reattach right here. That's what this arrow means. The arrow shows when a, an arrow originates from a bond, that bond is breaking. And then we typically draw the arrow to the atom where electrons are attaching to. And so in this case, those electrons are just kind of shifting over and attaching over here, which is why that hydrogen ends up attached to this carbon. But that actually is the only arrow. So, and this is your rearrangement. So specifically, this is a carbocation rearrangement, and you can kind of recognize a rearrangement because you, essentially, you don't gain any atoms, you don't lose any atoms, it's just a rearrangement in the structure uh, of the kind of the skeleton of the molecule, if you will. So that's kind of how you recognize your rearrangement. So at this point, we've covered nucleophilic attack, we've covered loss of a leaving group, we've covered bronsted acid base reactions, i.e. proton transfer, and now we finally covered rearrangement and carbocation rearrangement, the most common that you'll see. In fact, uh, in the next chapter, we'll definitely go back through carbocation rearrangements and go into this in a little more detail than just being able to recognize it and show the arrow pushing, but how to predict when it happens and things of a sort as well. All right, so last one here, and this one is separate from all the rest. It's not going to follow any of the normal patterns. This is not nucleophilic attack. It is not loss of a leaving group. It is not a bronsted acid base reaction proton transfer. It's not a rearrangement. This one involves radicals. Here we have a carbon radical and a bromine radical. So in the reactions involving radicals, the mechanisms are just actually going to be presented fairly differently from all the mechanisms of all the rest of the reactions we'll cover. And so there's usually a, a chapter on radical reactions, you know, somewhere at the end of first semester, possibly at the beginning of second semester, but usually at the end of first semester. And you'll find out that the mechanisms are going to be represented very differently than all the rest of the mechanisms we draw. So in sometimes in the arrows, because we're going to be having half headed arrows involved. So but also in just how we're uh, representing them, instead of having a, a linear progression of steps, you'll find out that we have one steps, you know, kind of presented uh, instead of having just like this goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, which will be common, we'll actually present these in kind of a repeating linear fashion. It'll be a little bit strange. So, but you'll see when we get there. So, but as far as predicting the arrow pushing here, so you can see that we're gonna end up with a new bond between this carbon and the bromine right there. And that these two radical, react, uh, radical electrons are gone, i.e. they must be the two electrons that are in that bond. And so the question is, how do we actually show that we're forming a new bond between this carbon and this bromine using these two electrons right here? Well, the way we show this, and again, this is not the most intuitive thing in the world, but the way we show this is we're going to put one of the electrons to form a new bond. So I kind of put it off into this empty space here in the area between the carbon and the bromine. And then we'll take another half headed arrow and do the same thing over here. So, and that way it, it kind of shows that they're going off into this space right where they would join them together. Sometimes you'll even see different uh, 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 organic drawing programs or even professors or textbooks. They'll put a little line in between the two and kind of draw these arrows as heading towards that line. So, it's, you know, some people like this, some people don't, whether or not you draw that line. So I've, I've seen it much more commonly without the line, but you'll see it both presented both ways. Whichever way your professor is presenting it, go with it. But I'm gonna go just like this, where there's no actual like dashed line drawn in where the bond's being created or anything like that. So I think people are making that for simplicity's sake and I actually technically like it. It's just, I've seen it less common that way. So, but this is again, the motion of one electron at a time, which is why we have again, those half headed arrows. And this really will be unique to radicals. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you've got questions on this lesson, feel free to ask them in the comment section below. Now, if you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, uh, it's part of my premium course on chadsprep.com. It turns out the study guides for the entire two semester course is over 160 pages long. Or if you're just looking for practice problem, whether it be quizzes or chapter tests or practice final exams, uh, I've got over 800 practice questions in the course as well. Check that out again on chadsprep.com.